So attachment parenting, something I've been meaning to talk about for a long time now, actually, but I've just kind of put it to the side because I figured it might might be a long video, might take me a long time to do notes and stuff for, which I was right. I have like 14 pages of notes, so let's go. Popularized by Martha and William Sears, they coined the term. They have their seven principles, what they call the seven B's of attachment parenting. Other attachment or parenting organizations like Attachment Parenting International uh, have their own sort of, you know, set of principles, but it's, it's basically the same thing as the baby B's, which are birth bonding, breastfeeding, baby wearing, bedding close to baby, belief in the language value of your baby's cry, beware of baby trainers, and balance. So even though attachment parenting promoters like Sears, even though they promote attachment parenting as the best way to raise a child and that any way that deviates from this way of raising children is going to put your children in, um, you know, some sort of emotional danger and they're not going to reach their full potential, even though they say that and promote attachment parenting that way, there's no evidence to support this. There's not a single study comparing attachment parenting to other forms of parenting. There is no evidence that by not doing skin to skin, baby wearing, breastfeeding, co-sleeping, that you are endangering your child or that you are putting them at greater risk of being insecurely attached, as Sears puts it. So all we have to go on are anecdotes, right? What parents say attachment parenting has done for them, for their children. Um, and even in that case, the anecdotes don't necessarily support AP claims. Critics like to dismiss AP parents and their children as, quote, needy mothers and clingy kids, but the kids didn't seem especially clinging to me, nor did they strike me as significantly more confident and happy than children raised the more mainstream way. Far from being paragons of empathy, I saw children kick each other, steal each other's toys, and generally behave as all toddlers do. For all the extraordinary effort these mothers made, the end result looked pretty much the same. None of this is surprising if you know the history of attachment parenting, if you know where it comes from, and I mean not just from Sears, but why they started promoting this, uh, it's not a parenting style that's based on science. Some mothers choose to go back to their jobs quickly simply because they don't understand how disruptive that is to the well-being of their babies. So many babies in our culture are not being cared for in the way God designed, and we as a nation are paying the price. That is from William Sears from his book, The Complete Book of Christian Parenting and Child Care. This is why Sears and other AP promoters can so easily dismiss any evidence that doesn't support their claims. The basis for AP is faith. Faith in the word of God, faith in the Christian family tradition, and faith in the mother's natural instinct to parent in an AP-approved way. More on that later. And honestly, I could just stop there. The burden of proof is on Sears and anyone else who's promoting attachment parenting to prove it, to show why attachment parenting is the best way to parent kids. They have not come even close to doing that. But you know, I want those mineral ads, so let's keep going. Number one, birth bonding. The way baby and parents get started with one another helps the early attachment unfold. The days and weeks after birth are a sensitive period in which mothers and babies are uniquely primed to want to be close to one another. A close attachment after birth and beyond allows the natural biological attachment promoting behaviors of the infant and the intuitive biological caregiving qualities of the mother to come together. Both members of this biological pair get off to the right start at a time when the infant is most needy and the mother is most ready to nurture. I mean, there's some kind of loaded language in there and kind of nonsense sounding stuff, the whole uniquely prime to be close to one another thing. I mean, look, myself and many mothers feel a lot closer to our babies once they get a little bit older, like around the two month mark for me. Um, I know for me with both my toddler and tiny baby, I feel a lot closer to them once they get around two to three months than I do at birth because around two, well, even like six weeks, honestly, when they start to smile, when they start to interact with you more, it's a lot easier to bond with them than when they're basically in a little coma. And I know there are some mothers who don't feel like a really strong bond until about six months. Acting as though this is just instinct and every mother is going to feel uniquely primed to be close to their baby in the early days is pretty shitty. A lot of moms don't feel that way and they're gonna feel really bad and guilty 
reading stuff like this. But anyway, I get the, the sentiment of the whole thing, right? Caring for babies in the early days is really important. Duh, obviously, no one is disputing that. The problem is how you define caring, how you define bonding. Because this is attachment parenting, caring slash bonding means constant caring slash bonding. When considering rooming in versus nursery care, we encourage most mothers and babies to enjoy rooming in. Full rooming in allows you to exercise your mothering instincts when the hormones in your body are programmed for it. In our experience, and that of others who study newborns, mothers and babies who fully practice rooming in versus nursery care enjoy the following benefits. And then they list a whole bunch of supposed benefits based on our experience. Clinical experience is great and it can lead to breakthroughs. It can lead to new guidelines. If doctors are constantly seeing things during their practice with their patients, then it can lead to new studies, et cetera, et cetera. But clinical experience on its own is not research. It's not science and it's absolutely at risk for confirmation bias. How much do you want to bet that the pediatrician who makes money selling attachment parenting and the idea that rooming in is good and necessary is going to ignore or just kind of miss all the moms who, instead of experiencing less anxiety with rooming in, experience more anxiety with rooming in because maybe they're extremely sleep deprived and they're constantly worried about dropping their baby. The truth is that there's no good evidence for any of these benefits, any of these claims. Even the claim that rooming in helps with breastfeeding is not really supported by the evidence. According to the systematic review that was published just last month, no conclusion on rooming in and breastfeeding duration can be drawn because the studies that exist are poor quality. But none of this actually matters because even Sears admits that constant bonding with the infant during the first few days is not necessary for a, quote, strong mother-infant attachment to form. We have seen adopting parents who, upon first contact with their one-week-old newborn, express feeling as deep and caring as those as biological parents in the delivery room. So then why the huge focus on this constant contact during those first few days, during those first few hours after the baby's born? Why the focus on rooming in in the hospital, especially considering the women who have spoken out against it, who have said that it was not the best option for them and their baby. And just as an aside, I'm not against rooming in at all. I'm against rooming in the way that it's done in America, which is basically you leave mommy and baby in their room, in their recovery room by themselves. And you check on them sometimes, but for the most part, they're on their own. Many cultures also room in, but the mother receives tons of help from other family members, often for weeks after labor. Leaving a sleep-deprived human who just gave birth, many of whom just had major surgery, C-section is major surgery, alone and responsible for a new living thing is just, it's madness. Now, obviously this is going to require a, a kind of cultural shift in America and in other places, but getting rid of nurseries without this cultural shift is going to make it really, really hard on many mothers. It's also personal preference and can change from birth to birth. With my first, with toddler, I needed the nursery. I could not sleep. I was so incredibly anxious. All the little sounds that they were making, I just thought, oh my God, are they are they dying now? What's happening? I could not sleep. I really, really needed the nursery and it was hard to get. You had to ask them, you had to wait for them to come. They would only take the baby for max two hours at a time, which is some bullshit. But you know, we used it once and even just that once helped a lot because I was actually able to sleep for like two hours. But with tiny baby, it was great. I didn't need the nursery at all. I was much more relaxed. I wasn't worried about anything happening to them. I was easily able to sleep in between breastfeeding. Every pregnancy is different. Every baby is different. Every mother is different, right? You're usually a different person the second, third, fourth time that you have a baby. And I just wish that hospitals would work to accommodate those of us who really need nurseries. But anyway, back to birth bonding. So another big part of birth bonding is skin to skin contact. Now the evidence shows that skin to skin contact for preterm babies can be hugely beneficial, but for full term babies, for healthy full term babies, skin to skin during the first hour or so may promote breastfeeding, but the evidence is too poor to draw any other conclusions. And skin to skin is not without 
risk if proper positioning is not used and if mommy and baby are not supervised. During the review of the 400 well-documented sudden unexpected postnatal collapse cases, the authors found that three out of every four were associated with prone positioning of the infant, typically during skin-to-skin -skin and initial attempts at breastfeeding. The scenario that is increasingly becoming the norm in many countries and which is most likely to result in SUPC, not to mention an increased risk of a baby falling out of the bed and suffering a head injury, is a tired mom lying in bed in a quiet, dimly lit room that promotes rest, a lack of nursing presence in the room or monitoring of the baby for long stretches of time, and skin-to-skin -skin contact. So this was exactly my experience this last time with my second kid with Tiny Baby. Uh, I was left to my own devices for two to four hours on several occasions. Now, this was great for me because number one, I got to sleep, and number two, I knew how to stay safe. I never you know, put the bed back and got comfortable and turned the lights off and put baby prone on me to breastfeed or just skin to skin because I knew that I would fall asleep and I did not want that to happen. So I never did that. I only did skin to skin when I was breastfeeding them and I was always upright. Otherwise, you know, again, I was holding them upright or they were in their bassinet. But what about the moms who don't know about these risks, who think that you should just be doing skin to skin all the time and it's fine and you don't need supervision and it's fine if you fall asleep. What about the moms who don't know about SUPC? That seems really dangerous and that's not just a knock on attachment parenting. This is becoming the norm where every single hospital, every doctor is promoting skin to skin and not explaining the risk to their patient and not making sure that mommy and baby are monitored, especially in that first hour or two. So birth bonding, uh, it's fine. Like <laughs> It's something that most of us, all of us are going to be doing anyway if you have an infant. Like you're you're gonna be spending time with your baby during those first few days and after that as well. There's no evidence that sending your kid to a nursery for a few hours or not doing skin to skin constantly or at all is going to leave your kid you know, insecurely attached. And again, rooming in and skin to skin are not without risk. So number two, breastfeeding. Now I've already talked about why breastfeeding breast milk is not that much better than formula. I know it's controversial, but eat my dick. That's the way it is. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but I do recommend this recent review. Um, it's a good breakdown of not only the benefits, but also like how many babies have to be breastfed in order for one baby to benefit. They also talk about the supposed benefits that aren't actually evidence-based and the risks as well, like that full-term infants who are exclusively breastfed are actually more likely to be hospitalized compared to formula-fed or mixed-fed infants because of low milk supply. So the babies are not getting enough food. They also talk about harm to the mother, which is usually not mentioned, so that's good. Um, harm to the mother due to, quote, feelings of inadequacy, guilt, loss of agency, anxiety, and physical pain during breastfeeding that interferes with, one, their ability to bond or otherwise care for their infant, and two, competing work obligations. The reality is that breastfeeding is really, really hard for a lot of us, and it's impossible for some of us. It is painful, it is exhausting, and it can negatively impact our relationship with our child. Breastfeeding might prevent certain infections in as many as 50% of infants, but a mother unable to breastfeed can take solace in the fact that greater than 95% of breastfed infants will not realize any benefit from the preventative potential of breastfeeding in regard to hospitalization or allergic disease, and over 99% will not realize benefit from either the prevention of SIDS or ALL or from improvement in long-term health measures, except for perhaps a slightly higher IQ. The breast is best mantra is likely true at a public health level. For the individual mother-infant dyad, however, where there is a need to balance personal, social, family, and financial factors, that mantra is an oversimplification. Choosing not to breastfeed, even if you can but you just don't want to, it just isn't a big deal. Presenting it as such, which everyone does, this is now a consensus, right? This is not just Sears and not offering alternatives, not offering formula for mothers who are cre clearly struggling. This is not evidence-based and it has terrible psychological consequences for mothers. So number three, baby wearing. Now baby wearing, for those who don't know, it's just putting baby in a, in a carrier or in a sling, you know, attached to your body. It can actually be pretty great. Many parents find that 
There are certain times when babies are just kind of inconsolable, not colic, that's a whole different thing, but just like normal baby shit, you know, <laughs> like they don't, they're not hungry, they don't need a diaper change, they just cry. And for many of us, we find that the one thing that soothes them is carrying them and not just holding them, but moving, right? Carrying them around. Um, a lot of people will actually put them in a car seat and put them in the car and drive them around to get them to, you know, calm down and go to sleep. And so having them in a carrier um, attached to you at least like frees up your hands, right? So you can kind of, kind of do some stuff. And sometimes it's more comfortable as well to have them that instead of just holding them like this or like this. Or you can get a mamaru, which is what we did. I mean, my, my parents got it for us with toddler and oh my God, it's amazing. For those who don't know, it's a little infant seat, but it also like moves like this and it's hella expensive. It's stupid expensive, but oh my God, we love that thing. It has been amazing with both kids. There's no other like kind of unnecessary product that I would say like, oh, you have to get this. But seriously, if you can get a mamaru, it is so worth it. Especially if you can't really use a carrier a lot like I can because my back is garbage and it really, really hurts. Uh, mamaru is it's pretty helpful. Anyway, baby wearing can have other benefits, um, carrying upright. Uh, so not like in the sling in like a cradle position, but having them upright like this facing you or facing away once they get to a certain age uh, can be really great if your kid suffers from acid reflux or just like spits up a lot. It can help prevent flat spots. Again, having them in that upright position. Uh, babies have really soft, soft heads and they can get flat spots on the back or even the sides of their head if they are in that position a lot. Usually, you know, lying in their crib or in a, a car seat or an infant seat like the mamaru for too long and they're not getting enough upright time, you know, you holding them or not enough tummy time, they can get flat spots. So again, having them in a carrier a lot can help prevent that. And baby wearing, again, having them in that specific position can help with head and neck control as well, which babies are working on a lot, especially for the first like three months before they can like finally hold their head up, which is still like I've had two kids and it's still just so crazy to me that they can't even hold their damn head up for like three months. That is one of the best experiences is when they can finally do that and you don't have to hold them like this anymore. <laughs> you, know, you can finally just kind of hold them like on your hip and you don't have to worry about their head. Oh man. We're so close to that with Tiny Baby and I'm so excited. It can also be just really enjoyable to carry baby around and to kind of bond with them in that way. It's like a really sweet experience. So yeah, this is all, all good stuff. But you can still soothe baby. You can still make sure they get enough exercise. You can still alleviate, you know, symptoms of acid reflux. You can still bond with your baby without baby wearing constantly or at all, there is no evidence that baby wearing is necessary. And just like with skin to skin and rooming in, it's not without its risks. Baby wearing improperly may increase the chance of hip dysplasia. The International Hip Dysplasia Institute does not recommend carrying baby in the cradle position or upright facing you with their legs hanging down, basically any position that has their legs straightened and their legs together. That is not good for infant hip development. And wouldn't you know it, on the Sears website, on their different ways, different holds for the baby sling page, they recommend both of those positions as appropriate ways to carry baby in a sling. And slings can even be deadly. So again, for those younger babies, you know, before three months or so, when they still don't have good head and neck control, putting them in that cradle position can lead to suffocation. It's rare, but it has happened to several babies. And I could not find anywhere on the Sears website anything telling parents not to put tiny babies in that cradle position. Oh, and one last thing. Uh, Sears actually sells a baby sling because, <laughs> because of course he does. And, you know... Just another little aside, I find this really funny because, you know, attachment parenting types are always so quick to look for, you know, conflicts of interest or whatever when anyone questions, like, for instance, breastfeeding, right? Like they're expecting them to be paid off by Similac or something like that, a shill for Similac. Uh, but, but they don't seem to have a problem with someone selling baby wearing while also selling a baby wearing device. Okay. Number four, bedding close to baby. And you've probably seen by now that a lot of these are not really 
controversial in terms of like, yeah, you can do that. Skin to skin, sure. Rooming in, sure. Breastfeeding, yeah, absolutely. Baby wearing, sure, if you want to. Again, it's just the idea that you have to do these things, that they're necessary for uh, a baby to be appropriately attached and not insecurely attached, right? But number four is the one thing that is absolutely not in line with mainstream guidelines. Dr. Sears promotes co-sleeping. And by co-sleeping, I actually mean bed sharing. It's a little bit confusing because sometimes people say co-sleeping and they mean sleeping in the same bed. Sometimes they say co-sleeping and they just mean sleeping in the same room. So I'm going to say room sharing for sleeping in the same room and bed sharing for sleeping in the same room in the same bed. Dr. Sears promotes bed sharing. And on the uh, co-sleeping, again, bed sharing, safely page, he quote unquote proves that it's safe by criticizing a study from 1999 because no studies on bed sharing have been conducted in the last two decades, right? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure all of this was written like a long time ago, like probably almost two decades ago, which is still bad, like why you would still have that up on your site and not updated. Yeah, you, you really care about accurate information and promoting accurate information to mothers and fathers, right? The truth, of course, is that bed sharing increases the risk for SIDS and that the Back to Sleep campaign has been hugely successful in reducing the cases of SIDS. Yes, you can make bed sharing safer by following Sears guidelines, and if you're going to bed share, please follow those guidelines, but it's still not going to be as safe as having baby alone on their back in their own crib. Part of the reason why is because you can't really control what you do while you're asleep. And if you are a heavy sleeper, it is possible that you could roll over um, onto or against your baby without even knowing that you're doing it. Uh, there was a video from someone, they recorded themselves, they set up a camera to see exactly how their themselves and their wife uh, were sleeping with their baby at night. And there was a part where he actually took the baby from the middle of the bed, picked the baby up and put the baby on his chest. Again, prone on his chest, which as I discussed before, is not safe to do without supervision or when you are asleep. And he actually did that. He had no idea that he did it. He did it in his sleep. And of course, the main benefit of bed sharing is that it makes uh, getting up at night, it makes breastfeeding a lot easier, which is true, right? You don't have to get up and sit in a chair. You can just lie in bed and let baby nurse. But the problem is how likely is it going to be that you fall asleep with your baby, with your tiny baby pressed up against your boob? That is not safe. I'm not here at all to criticize parents who end up bed sharing. It is incredibly common. Raising kids is really hard. Getting enough sleep with kids is really hard. And I realize that for a lot of parents, it is easier and it helps you get a lot more sleep to bed share, to have your kid in the bed with you. Not everyone's kids sleep as well in a crib as ours do, right? And, you know, maybe it's because we do have them in a separate room, which I'll talk about in a minute. Maybe it's because we have it really dark. You know, we do a lot of things to make sure that it can work, but that doesn't mean that it's it's going to be as easy for everyone. I totally get that. And look, the overall risk for SIDS, I mean, I hate saying that because we're, we're talking about babies dying, but the overall chance is very, very low, even for people who bed share. If my choice was between keeping baby in a crib and being so sleep deprived that I can't drive safely, right? And having them sleep with me and actually getting enough sleep to function properly and to be able to drive a car without worrying that I'm going to kill myself or my child or someone else, I uh, I know which option I'd choose, but there is a huge difference between talking with your patients if you're a pediatrician and being understanding and under being sympathetic uh, when it comes to sleep and bed sharing and promoting bed sharing as the ideal. That is absolutely shameful. As far as room sharing is concerned, that's totally fine if you're into it. The American Academy of Pediatrics actually does recommend it uh, pretty strongly now for the first six months, um, and they claim that it can actually reduce the risk of SIDS by up to 50%. That's based on very little and very limited research, actually, which is kind of disappointing on the part of the AAP, but they've done that before. They do that with 
screen time and kids as well, which is a whole another thing. Um, and also parents who room share are probably more likely to bring their kids into the bed with them, which of course increases the risk for SIDS. And room sharing can have effects on the parents as well. It can lead to sleep deprivation for some of us, which can increase the risk for postpartum depression. Dr. Fern R. Hawk, she's a professor who worked on the task force that came up with this new policy on room sharing for the AAP, said the panel hadn't given great thought to parents' sleep before issuing the recommendation. Parents will probably need to get used to it. I have some words I could say, but they're not very nice, so... Let's move on to number five. Number five, belief in the language value of your baby's cry. AKA, don't even think about try and cry it out. Don't even think about it. Uh, so basically this whole section, this whole thing is just one big straw man. If you go to the cry it out page, when Sears says cry it out, he's not referring to the popular cry it out method, the Ferber method. He is just talking about letting your baby cry just forever until they stop crying. He acts as though this is standard advice, and maybe it was decades ago. I'm sure it was. I mean, you know, doctors used to promote and doctors used to think that babies were manipulative, right? And they need to be trained. But that is not the norm and hasn't been the norm for quite a while now. The cry is a marvelous design. Consider what might happen if the infant didn't cry. He's hungry, but doesn't awaken. He sleeps through the night, brags the parent of a sleep-trained baby. He hurts, but doesn't let anyone know. The result of this lack of communication is known, ultimately, as failure to thrive. Thriving means not only getting bigger, but growing to your full potential emotionally, physically, and intellectually. First, failure to thrive has a very specific definition, and it has nothing to do with emotional or intellectual growth. You would think that a that a pediatrician would know that. Second, sleeping through the night means that a child is not thriving. Evidence? Again, he is presenting cry it out as just letting your kid cry with no intervention whatsoever. Just letting them cry until they stop because they realize no one is coming. Ferber never says you should simply leave your baby in her crib and shut the door behind you. His progressive waiting approach allows you to gradually limit the amount of time you spend in your child's room while providing regular comfort and reassurance, as well as reassuring yourself that she's okay. So basically you start with maybe a minute or so and then go in and comfort them without picking them up. Then leave, go in after two minutes and comfort them without picking them up and keep going until they fall asleep. Now we only did this with our toddler for naps. And so we set a limit of 20 minutes. So we would do this again in increasing um, increments every time until we hit 20 minutes. And if they were still awake, which they were for like the first two times that we did it, they would still be crying. And so then we just hold them and do our normal thing, you know, to get them to nap, which was basically holding them until they fell asleep. After just a few naps, they, that was it. Like they would go to sleep on their own. We would just, you know, do our little routine of sitting with them and reading to them and getting them a little bit tired. And then we'd put them in their crib. Sometimes they'd cry for like, 30 seconds to a minute, and then they'd go to sleep. It was glorious. And we actually had to do this, I want to say three times, just due to getting our, like, you know, schedule mixed up because, like, we had to move. We had to go through the process again because our schedule and naps and everything was messed up. But every single time that we did it, it only took, like, two or three naps, and that was it. And it was hard. I'm not going to lie. It was hard for me to listen to them because they're full on crying. You know, they're like that they can't stop their crying, like the, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Oh, it's, it's hard to listen to, it really is. But again, for us, it was just two or three naps and they were so happy. Like they were in a better mood. They were napping longer. You know, they would only nap for like maybe 30, 40, 40 minutes on us, but having them in a quiet, dark room, which was really, really important, and also having them fall to sleep on their own, in their own space, in the dark, they would sleep for three hours. And again, wake up in much, much, much better mood. Not trying to sell anyone on Cry It Out. I know for some parents, it just does not work. From For some kids, it just does not work. Uh, but it really worked for us. And if you're really struggling with getting your kids to go to sleep, you know, at night or with naps or whatever, 
it's worth trying. And the evidence does not support the notion that cry it out that Ferber is harmful for babies. The few RCTs that we have find it to be not only effective at getting kids to sleep longer, but also safe. The 2012 study that people like Sears love to cite as evidence that cry it out causes distress is pretty garbage. This study should never have been published, at least not in its current form. Middlemiss and colleagues had no control group, they performed the wrong statistical analyses, they had huge amounts of missing data which they did not account for at all, her key findings relied on less than half of her original sample of 25. These are not minor nitpicky problems, these are major glaring problems that make interpretation of her findings impossible. And the idea that cry it out would negatively affect baby's long-term, like, emotional well-being just doesn't make sense. Uh, Expecting Science talks about this in this article on short-term stress versus chronic stress. And again, obviously, <laughs> Cry It Out can be really, really good for parents and for our relationship with our babies. It's really hard to be the best parent you can be and to fully enjoy parenting when you are severely sleep deprived. If cry it out has helped a family, if it's helping a baby sleep better, if it's helping parents sleep better, if it's helping those parents be better parents, to tell people that cry it out is harmful for every baby, for every parent, is disgusting. Number six, beware of baby trainers. Attachment parenting teaches you how to be discerning of advice, especially those rigid and extreme parenting styles that teach you to watch a clock or a schedule instead of your baby. You know, the cry it out crowd. This convenience parenting is a short-term gain, but a long-term loss and is not a wise investment. These more restrained styles of parenting create a distance between you and your baby and keep you from becoming an expert in your child. Again, this is a total straw man. So while there are like the baby behavioralist types, right? They're crying because they're trying to manipulate you. Yes, there are still people who exist who believe that, but that is not the norm. And that is not what most people in the cry it out crowd promote or practice with their children. Not every person who does Ferber even uses a schedule at all. You don't have to do any sort of scheduling if you're using Ferber. Many of us do, like myself, but it's not any sort of rigid schedule. It is a much more um, relaxed kind of loose schedule. So with Toddler, I really liked Tracy Hogg's easy approach. It's in her Baby Whisperer book. Easy stands for eat, activity, sleep, you. And it's nothing that's like set on any sort of time. It kind of is. It's just very loose. It's basically just here are the things that you do over and over again, right? So baby wakes up, you feed them, you have some play time, they go back to sleep. And while they're asleep, you have you time, right? Where you can take a shower or just read or cook or, you know, whatever you want to do. And then it starts over again once they wake up. Again, it's a schedule in the sense that you're doing the same things over and over in a specific order, but it's not like a feed baby at this time, you know, every single day sort of rigid schedule. She speaks out against such scheduling in the book. Now that tiny baby is eating more at one sitting, they actually slept through the night two nights in a row. Oh my god, it's so exciting. It just kind of happened. Uh, now that they're doing that, we might start doing the easy approach with them. They're getting to the age where it might be time to do that. I think with toddler, we started that maybe three or four months, or maybe we won't. You know, it really doesn't matter, you know, if you want to do some sort of loose scheduling, if you want to do just the baby on demand thing, you just kind of give them what they want when they want it, which is what, you know, everyone promotes, like every baby site now, um, all the big ones, want to expect, baby center the bump, all of them promote that, not just attachment parenting. It really doesn't matter, you know, as long as you are meeting baby's needs, feeding them, playing with them, making sure they get enough sleep, giving them tummy time, you know, all that sort of stuff, you are doing awesome. There's no evidence that any sort of loose scheduling, if that's what you want to do, is harmful for babies. And obviously scheduling can be hugely, hugely beneficial for parents. Being able to carve out that time, you know, again, having like an easy approach where you actually have you time while they're asleep and you know when it's coming and you can kind of plan for it and plan what you're going to do, that can be hugely beneficial. And finally, number seven, balance. In your zeal to give so much to your baby, it's easy to neglect the needs of yourself and your marriage. As you will learn, the key to putting balance in your parenting is being appropriately responsive to your baby, knowing when to say yes and when to say no, and having the wisdom to say yes to yourself when you need help. 
So this feels like a bunch of bullshit to me. <laughs> After going through, uh, you know, the six baby bees, number seven kind of feels like a bunch of bullshit. It feels like someone read the first six and went, uh, you know, I, I think you need to add a seven because it kind of seems like you don't care about parents and how parents are doing. You might want to add something in like, hey, don't forget about yourself. Take care of yourself. Yeah, it really feels tacked on and not sincere. Sears doesn't seem like he or Martha or his wife, it doesn't seem like they really care about parents and how parents are doing. Everything is about baby and baby's well-being. Don't do cry it out because it'll harm baby, even though there's no evidence for that. And of course, cry it out can be hugely beneficial, hugely helpful for parents. Stay with baby 24 seven in the hospital so that you can always breastfeed them, even though this can be really hard on parents, particularly mothers. Breastfeed no matter what, even though formula is fine and many mothers suffer emotionally because of this breast is best message. Baby wearing is essential even though it's not, and also F you to all the moms who have back and knee and hip problems. Like, I guess we're all just destined to be, to be shitty mothers. Sears never mentions possible benefits of the practices that he advocates against, that he tells you not to do. And usually these benefits are for the mother and the mother's well-being. And he never mentions downsides of the practices that he espouses, that he promotes. Usually these downsides are for the mother and the mother's well-being. I don't believe for a second that these people care about balance. They care about babies and they care about doing what's right for babies. And of course, what's right means whatever they say is right. And so those are the seven baby bees and it's pretty bad. <laughs> and you know, if you're thinking that this is just Sears and just his interpretation, just his wife's interpretation, again, they did create attachment parenting. Uh, you're wrong. <laughs> Here's some quotes from other people in the attachment parenting world. This one is from the founder of Attachment Parenting UK. I think a lot of mothers have become disconnected from their instincts. AP supports women in what they instinctively want. They want to carry their baby and wake up to them and feed them from the breast. So let's support them and let's support women who aren't doing it, but aren't happy with what they are doing. Sure, support mothers who want to do that, who want to parent in an AP type way, but please don't assume that every single parent, every single mother wants to do this. Many of us do not want to carry our babies everywhere. Many of us do not want to wake up in the middle of the night to breastfeed or to breastfeed at all. Saying that these things are just instinctive, that these things are instinctively what every single woman wants, implies that the women who don't want that are inferior in some way or are just like not real women. So thanks. I asked Mikhail if she doesn't think some women just want to put their baby in the cot at the end of the day while they have a glass of wine instead of holding them for hours until they fall asleep. She looks puzzled. Well, I've met mums who were told by their friends not to pick up their crying babies, even though their instinct was shouting at them to do it, but they doubted themselves and later felt the sadness of not responding the way they wanted to. The Sears have gone much further than this, suggesting in their books that the only reason a woman might struggle with attachment parenting is because, quote, your marriage was shaky going into pregnancy, or if you and your husband were not really ready. They also suggest that, quote, women with a history of sexual abuse may find it difficult. So yeah, it's, it's not even implied, it's directly stated. Sears and others in the attachment parenting movement really believe that the only reason that a woman, that a mother would not like attachment parenting is because there is something wrong with her or her relationship with her partner. Cool. And here's another quote. This one is from the founder of Attachment Parenting International. Later by email, Nicholson suggests I write about how attachment parenting can help with the quote, prevention of violence, referring specifically to Omar Mateen. Quote, it's so disheartening to hear reports like this and not go more in depth about what happens to kids who are marginalized and bullied and perhaps not receiving the support and love they need in the home. What the fuck? Even if we knew for a fact that Mateen did what he did because he was bullied, that doesn't mean that attachment parenting could have prevented that. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. And putting that kind of pressure on parents, that if you don't parent your kids perfectly, if you don't prevent them from being bullied, they're gonna end up as little sociopaths. Wow, 
that is evil. Nobody is a perfect parent, obviously. And also a lot of personality, personality traits are wrapped up in genetics. You know, there's not, there's not a whole lot that you can do about low empathy, right? A lot of these killers have low empathy and low impulse control. There's not a lot that attachment parenting or any other parenting style can do about that other than just be nice to your kids. You know, don't hit your kids, provide shelter, provide food for them. This is all basic stuff that has nothing to do with a specific parenting style, including attachment parenting. So yeah, attachment parenting is clearly all about fear. It's all about making you fearful, making you fear that you are going to be a bad parent and your kid's going to end up just, <laughs> it's, it's insane, not only insecurely attached, but a murderer, apparently. To go back to Sears for a minute, this is from the Sears website from their benefits of baby wearing page. What may happen if the baby spends most of his time lying horizontally in a crib attended to only for feeding and comforting and then again separated from mother? A newborn has an inherent urge to become organized to fit into his or her new environment. If left to his own resources without the regulating presence of the mother, the infant may develop disorganized patterns of behavior. Colicky cries, jerky movements, disorganized self-rocking behaviors, anxious thumb sucking, irregular breathing, and disturbed sleep. The infant, who is forced to self-calm, wastes valuable energy he could have used to grow and develop. This is what's presented as the alternative to baby wearing. So you're either baby wearing constantly, or you're just leaving them in their crib aside from feeding and like comforting when they're crying. I'm pretty sure there's an in-between. <laughs> like I'm pretty sure most parents are taking their kids out of their cribs just, just because, like just to play with them, just to spend time with them. This is a ridiculous straw man that only serves to make you afraid, make you afraid that if you don't wear your baby all the time, apparently, your kid, you're going to ruin your kid, right? You're going to hurt your kid and they're going to end up colicky and with irregular breathing. <laughs> you have to laugh because it's so, it's so terrible. Like it really, you know, for those of you who are parents, you know what a touchy time this is. Even if you know, like for someone like me who knows all of this is garbage, it can still be hard. It can still be hard to read these kind of things where someone is saying, if you do this thing, you're harming your child. You know, it's such a touchy time and you're not exactly yourself, you know, for a long time after birth. And it can be really, really hard to not be emotionally affected by stuff and, and to not let those feelings dictate your actions. This is why I'm so aggravated by people like this because they really are preying on people when they are their most vulnerable. You know, the only other, you know, I, I guess when you've lost a loved one, right? That's another time when you're very vulnerable and wouldn't you know it, there are people preying on you then too. Funeral directors will be sure to sell you on the most expensive casket they have. You want to, you want to give what's best, you know, for your deceased loved one, right? But anyway, <laughs> Look, if, if parents genuinely want to practice attachment parenting, you know, assuming that they're doing it safely, right? Like they're not, I don't know, wearing them so much that they don't get enough independent time. They don't get enough tummy time, right? That would be bad. Assuming they're doing it safely and correctly. Cool. Just because there's no evidence showing AP to be, you know, the, the best way to parent, that doesn't mean that there's evidence showing it to be harmful either, right? Like it's, it's probably fine. Again, as long as you're doing it safely, as long as you're practicing safe baby wearing and safe co-sleeping and all that kind of shit, like it's fine. It probably doesn't really matter. The things that matter, making sure baby is fed, making sure baby is loved, making sure baby is sheltered. None of these have anything to do with parenting style. Attachment parenting is fine as long as it's something that both parents are happy with. But many of us are not happy with attachment parenting. It's not an arrangement that works for us, including myself, if I haven't made that pretty obvious throughout the video. Skin to skin doesn't really work for me. I, it just hmm, feels kind of gross if I'm being honest. So yeah, I didn't really do that a whole lot with my kids, you know, a little bit in the hospital while breastfeeding and stuff. But then of course I moved on to pumping and formula feeding. So pretty much done with that. You know, I'm really affectionate with my kids, obviously hugging and all that kind of stuff, but I don't really like the whole tummy to tummy thing. It just feels kind of gross. 
I don't know. Baby wearing, I think I already mentioned or alluded to. Yeah, it doesn't really work for me. My back sucks. So yeah. Breastfeeding, obviously I've talked about that a lot. The trouble ahead breastfeeding my kids. Uh, I've talked before about our sleeping arrangements. Not only have I never shared a bed at all with toddler or tiny baby, but we don't even share the same room. Uh, I learned real quick with toddler that sleeping with a baby in the room is kind of hard. Um, again, it was a lot easier with tiny baby in the hospital because I wasn't like anxious and first time mom kind of shit, you know? But even still, we prefer having them in a separate room. And by separate room, I mean, like I'm in my kid's nursery right now. Our bed is like just a few feet away. So tiny baby is here. We're right there. There's like a wall and then there's a door and we have the door open. We actually don't have a door yet. <laughs> I've got like a blanket hanging over that we kind of have pulled up. So yeah, they're like right here, but there's some amount of soundproofing, you know, and we feel like we have some privacy, which speaking of privacy, I mean, look, I, I have no desire to make our room the family room, <laughs> like the family bedroom, right? Which is kind of what attachment parenting is all about. That doesn't really work for me and my partner. That doesn't, that doesn't work for us. I like having alone time with partner at night. I think that is really important for our relationship. I'm not really interested in being creative. You'll often hear attachment parenting types talk about like uh, being creative with sex, right? With sexy time. Like you gotta be creative and find time to have sex, which is exactly what that really means. It means that Nighttime is now still baby time because all the time is baby time. So you have to try and find time to be intimate with your partner. Uh, that's If that works for you, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I know that for us, we would not be able to find that time and we would just spend less time with one another, which is not good for a marriage. We need to have that time every single day, every single night to ourselves. And no, I'm not gonna do the stuff while baby is in the room. That's just not, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you can do that, that's awesome. But hearing baby coos and seeing baby kind of kills my lady boner. And there seems to have been like no downside for our kids. Toddler sleeps amazingly at night and they always have since two months, since they started sleeping through the night, they have slept so great. I think maybe total, like maybe 10 times they've like woken up randomly at night and we've been like, hey, what's wrong? And I learned real quick, do not get them up. Oh my God, if they are crying in their bed, the last thing you wanna do, at least for my kid, is get them up because they just, that's not what they want. And they'll just cry and cry and cry and they're too out of it to tell you that they just wanna go back to bed. <laughs> But they're crying. So it's like, oh, I want to hold them and like make them feel better. But they're just getting worse and worse. And partner's like, just put them. They just want to go to sleep. Put them back in their bed. I'm like, no, they're crying. Maybe I can comfort them. No, just put them back in their bed. And then of course I put them in their bed and they go right back to sleep. So yeah, learn my lesson on that one. But yeah, I mean, I'll, nine times out of 10, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they've, they're just amazing, amazing sleepers, you know, and I'm not saying that's going to work for everyone, obviously, but for us, uh, it's been pretty great. And they moved to a bed. They moved from their crib to uh, a bed. It's just a twin mattress on the floor, but they, they moved to that immediately. No problem. They slept in it first night, no problem. And they've been sleeping in it since. And you know, they never had to go through the process of moving out of our room or moving out of our bed. Oh my God, we never had to go through that because they've just always had their own room. They've always slept by themselves in the dark. They've never been afraid of the dark. That's another thing that Sears kind of uh, presents it as like, the dark is scary. Nighttime is so scary for kids. Like, yeah, if you present it that way, but we've never done that. And it's just always been normal for our kid to have their own room. So like, they're not, they're not afraid of the dark. They don't have a nightlight or anything. And again, tiny baby who is just over two months, just slept through the night twice in the row. I know I'm jinxing, jinxing it now. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe we're doing something right. Another thing we use pacifiers, which is something I didn't mention earlier. Sears is fully against pacifiers. Um, again, a lot of like big pro breastfeeding people are, even though they may decrease the risk of SIDS even more than breastfeeding. And the whole nipple confusion thing is probably a myth. Uh, we've also done baby training again. I already talked about that. You know, the baby whisper stuff and cry it out as well. I'm also not the primary caregiver which, you know, the attachment parenting will say, well, you don't, it's not just about the mom. It's also about the dad. Yeah. Okay. Bullshit. <laughs> it's mostly about the mom. And if you read most of Sears writing, he explicitly says mother, it's very clearly 
more about the mother baby dyad. And then the dad's just kind of there. Again, it's that whole Christian family tradition thing, right? The dad works, the mom's at home with the baby, the way God intended. Yeah, I am not the primary caregiver. That's actually my partner. Uh, we do a kind of schedule where I work during the week, like normal people, right? Except I work from home. Um, I work during the week, Monday through Friday, and he takes care of the kids primarily. I mean, again, I'm here, so I'm like always kind of going up and helping out and stuff. And it makes, it makes working kind of hard because I don't, I don't really have a designated space yet. Partner's actually working on making me a desk down in our room. Eventually I'll have a studio. It'll be amazing, but I don't know when that's going to happen, but I'm going to at least have a desk downstairs that's like away from all of the stuff going on with the kids, right? Because it's very distracting. But uh, yeah, I'm still like going upstairs and hanging out with the kids and helping out and everything. But yeah, he still primarily takes care of them for most of the week. And then on the weekend, we switch, right? Where I'm taking care of them and he's working on the house and doing other stuff, which is how we planned on doing it. That was my only thing with having kids was like, I knew... I know myself well enough to know that being a stay-at-home mom is not going to work for me. Like, I need to work and I need to have time to myself and time to do other things. I just knew I was I would not be happy if I am the one taking care of the kids all the time, you know. And I, I'm not saying that um, parents who have that more traditional style that the dads don't do anything. Of course, I'm not saying that, you know, I grew up in that style and my dad was there hanging out with us. Of course, my mom did most of everything and I spent way more time with her, but my dad was there too. And he was spending lots of time with us on the weekend and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying for me, that sort of arrangement would not work for me. And I, I'm pretty positive. I would not be happy. I love my kids to death, but that would not work for me. And so that was something, you know, we had to talk about and I had to make clear when we were discussing having children. It was like, okay, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm totally into that, but you're, you're going to have to be doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> you're going to have to be taking care of the kids because I'm going to keep working. And yeah, it works for us, but obviously not very attachment parenting friendly, right? Okay. So, um, I guess that's it. And, you know, look, if the scientific literature pointed to any of this being bad, being bad, being dangerous for my kids, making them quote unquote insecurely attached, then that would be pretty shitty of me, right? I would be pretty selfish for not sharing a bed with them, right? Or using a pacifier, you know, all these different things. But again, that's not what the evidence says. I'm just trying to do, I think what every parent is trying to do, which is just trying to find a, a method that works best for the family, you know, trying to meet everyone's needs, trying to meet your kids needs, your partner's needs, your needs, trying to strike that balance. A happy kid doesn't guarantee a happy family. And for us, you know, having my partner sleep on the couch while myself and baby sleep in the bedroom in the bed, that does not sound happy. I'm not saying that I have it all figured out and that it's always easy because it's not. But, you know, knowing myself well enough, knowing what I like and what I don't like, you know, not pretending that nursing and skin to skin are just beautiful and wonderful for me when they're not, when I don't like them, it's really important. And of course, not giving in to fear and faith-based campaigns like attachment parenting helps tremendously. Although again, even for me, even for someone who knows that it's bullshit, it hasn't always been easy. There's really a whole lot more I could talk about here. Uh, I kind of want to, but this is so, I mean, I've been recording for so long, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about in terms of like the history of attachment parenting and how Sears developed attachment parenting, you know, not via scientific research, obviously. For instance, uh, when it comes to baby wearing, it, it just all stems from his like, very short-term experience with some women in Zambia and they were wearing their babies and apparently the babies seemed really content. So baby wearing is essential. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, uh, the article Why I Hate Dr. Sears goes into more detail on this and this this myth of like the natural mother with her calm, contented baby who never cries, right? Uh, it's a good read. Oh, and his son, Bob Sears, wrote the vaccine book, I think it's called, which promotes the uh, delayed vaccine schedule. So uh, 
yeah, great family. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe. That's cool. Support the channel. Patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. And I will have a new video soon. And again, tiny baby who is just over two months just slept through the night twice in a row. I know I'm jinxing it now. I don't really believe in jinxing, but I kind of do. <laughs> it's like one of those stupid things. Like I'm not superstitious at all in any way. Oh God, my hair, postpartum hair loss. This is bad. Uh, but, but yeah, there's part of me with jinxing is like, maybe, maybe it's kind of real. <laughs> it's not real, but it might be, you know, it's stupid.